Howard Redwood here delivering the webinar on the highway code updates. Okay, so the aims of the session um, is really simple, is to go through the amendments to the highway code. There's nine altogether, there's 51 changes to the rules. We're not going through those. We're going through the generic nine and how these affect us as well. So I've been sent a load of pre-questions before by people. Thank you, Angela. I, I did email you just before the webinar to say I got your questions. I don't know if you got the, the uh, confirmation, but I have got them. Um, so the law changed 29th of January, which is last Saturday. We're all aware of that. That's why you're all here. And uh, on Monday the 31st, there was a survey that was published to say that one third of all drivers were still unaware of the changes on the roads. Um, now, we've got to remember there's 65, pretty nearly 65 million people living in the UK, and that's 65 potential pedestrians, 65 million potential deaf pedestrians. So, and a lot of those have got licenses. So we've got an awful lot of the population that don't understand these highway code rules, and especially the hierarchy side. And of course, we are confused as well because um, we are asking questions where we want clarification and the highway code is a general book of rules and regulations um, and not all of them are enforceable in law and that's where we're getting the problem because we're getting the words must and we're getting the words should so we've got a lot of work to do ourselves to understand what's going on and i'm glad you're all here um, and what we're going to do is move on if we can please tom tom's in the background he's doing all the slides for me in the bits and pieces let's go to the four main alterations um, we've got the hierarchies uh, of road users to ensure those who can do the greatest harm have the greatest responsibility to reduce the danger or threat they may pose to others. The problem we've got is putting this onus on the big lorry drivers. The government are trying to recruit lorry drivers into um, the industry, into uh, the driving industry for moving of goods. And it's not going to help when these guys have already got a tremendously difficult job of having eyes all over the place when they're driving these 21 meter long units uh, in some quite narrow situations, in some very challenging situations already, um, challenged by the width, challenged by heights and overhangs, challenged by little tiny dumbbells on the corners of roads that you've got to try and get round and swinging to junctions with the cyclists, with the pedestrians, with the mopeds, with the mo is all sorts of things you've got to deal with. And to say that they're going to put more onus of responsibilities there's a huge struggle, as Andrew's just said here, it's a big enough struggle as it is, without that onus going on. I mean, it's not really going to attract people to the driver industry if they're going to put more onus on these people for the money they're being paid. So as far as we're concerned, this is a bit of a problem. Um, but we've got to clarify the existing rules. I'm sorry about that noise, if you can hear it. It's, uh, we've got a web-based phone system here, and I can't turn that off. Uh, clarifying the existing rules on pedestrians, um, pedestrian priority on pavements to advise um, drivers and riders should give way to pedestrians crossing or waiting to cross. Now, pedestrians are now, according to the highway code, uh, is now including the uh, disabled carts, disabled buggies, the class two and class three wheeled, uh, four wheel and three wheel buggies that go on the pavements. They are classed as pedestrians. So we need to know that now before we go any further. Okay. Um, if we can move on to the next slide, please. Um, what's changed? Uh, providing guidance on cyclist priority, sorry, providing guidance on cyclist priority at junctions to advise drivers to give priority when traveling straight ahead. That's something else we're gonna talk about. Establishing guidance on safe passing distances and speeds when overtaking cyclists and horse riders. Uh, we have to make sure we've got slightly more um, clearances uh, at 30 miles an hour and more at higher speeds. So if you could move on, Tom, please. So the hierarchy of roads is, is, is the biggest thing. It's, it's a, a new introduction into the highway code. And basically, if you think of it as a pyramid, the people who can be hurt the most, i.e. the pedestrians, the people that are not protected by a safety cage or speed or anything else, they can't accelerate. It's very easy out of the way of anything else. They are at the top of the, of the pyramid, as it were followed by um, cyclists and horse riders, horse-drawn vehicles, motorcyclists, uh, moped riders, and then we've got the cars, the vans, the lorries and buses, etc. So there's a hierarchy of pyramid structure where the people at the bottom of the structure have to have more 
uh, more onus on those people in the bottom of the structure to uh, look at the risks that they pose to the more vulnerable people, pretty much just what it is. So it's a concept that places those road users at most at risk in the event of a collision at the top of the hierarchy. So obviously we've got the situation where we're confused about pedestrians crossing junctions, and we're gonna go through that in a minute. Um, but the, the, it, as it says here, the hierarchy does not remove the need for everyone to behave responsibility. Now it also says, elsewhere in the highway code, which I haven't put a quote here, I don't think I have, um, that pedestrians, they need to have their own responsibility to make sure they cross where they can be seen in safe locations. So ideally, a safe location obviously would be where pedestrian controlled and uncontrolled pedestrian crossing points have been put. So light controlled junctions are controlled junctions, zebra crossings are uncontrolled junctions and then we have the hierarchy of refuges in the middle of the roads and then we have a place where they cross where there's nothing so we're looking at these people making an informed choice of where they actually cross the road in the first place they do have a safety onus for themselves and the other road users using the road although we've got the hierarchy it isn't all one way a bit like the a bit like the health and safety law in in industry uh, the employer has a duty of care to the employee, but the employee also has a duty of care to help maintain a safe environment. It's exactly the same thing. The, the, um, effectively, the pedestrians are the employees. They do still have a duty to help maintain the safe environment by making sure they cross at safe locations where they can be seen. Uh, and that is listed uh, so, so elsewhere. Um, We'll, I've got a question here about Andrew Collins. We're going to be talking about training, the training of guide dogs very shortly. Um, Andrew, Amanda, uh, National Media Campaign, but the new changes don't start to the 14th of February. But they, they started, they've already started. It's not the 14th of February. They are already in, and the DVSA are actually marking uh, driving tests. They have been given a time for people to settle down, but the DVSA have sent out um, actually, through the dispatch, there's a, a dispatch that was sent out through Mark Wynn at the DVSA to tell all driving instructors exactly what the DVSA have been told to consider uh, for the changes of the highway code. And I can probably give you the link for that later on. I don't think I've put it in here because it only came to me this morning. So um, let's move on, please, Tom, if you will, with the hierarchy. So the hierarchy one, there's three of them. And really, H1 is just a statement of intent, really. It's uh, everyone's to make rules and regulations. And it does say that it is, all, it is important that all road users are aware of the highway code, uh, consider to others, understand their responsibility for the safety of others. So it's a statement, basically. Those in charge of vehicles that can do the greatest harm, they've got more responsibility to those that they can harm, pretty much. Cyclists and horse riders and drivers of horse-drawn vehicles also have the responsibility to reduce the danger to pedestrians and also that the people that can cause more harm have the responsibility to the horse-drawn vehicles, the horse riders and the cyclists and the, and the motorcyclists. But none of this detracts the responsibility of all road users, including pedestrians, cyclists and horse riders, to have regard for their own and other road users' safety. So we've got this hierarchy, but it doesn't mean to say that the pedestrians now and the cyclists now own the roads. They might think they do, but they have got a safety to themselves. And that will be looked at by the police in the event of incidents. Did they actually try to keep themselves safe in the first place? So we've got a statement of intent really is what H1 is. Now, if we go to H2, so H2 is, is a rule for drivers, motorcyclists, horse-drawn vehicles, horse riders and cyclists to give way to pedestrians crossing the mouth of a minor road. Now, a mouth of a junction exists from major to minor, there is an exception to that, and I'll go through that in a minute, but it exists from major to minor. So when you are entering from a major road into a minor road, if there is not already some form of device controlling the pedestrians, i.e. light control pedestrian crossings or zebra crossing, if they are standing on the side of the pavement, uh, or if they're standing in the road, you must give way to them. If they are standing on the pavement, you should give way to them. Okay, now should 
should be translated to ought to. Must is mandatory. Must is like um, a posted speed limit with a red ring around it. You mustn't go past that speed, it's mandatory. A white line in the road, a solid white line at a junction, it's a stop sign. You must stop. You must stop the world from turning. Um, a situation where you have a hexagonal red stop sign, you must stop. Wheels must stop turning. Now, if you've got a must, you've got to do it. But where you've got a should, a should is an informed decision. And that's what the law says with the highway code. It's an informed choice to whether you do it, bearing, bearing in mind what other road users are doing. So it really means that we've got to put a bigger onus to our pupils to be more alert of what's going around. Yes, they're going to have to look into junctions earlier. They're going to have to look, if they're turning right, this is from a major road, they're going to have to look ahead earlier and assess the approaching traffic, weigh up the pros and cons. If someone's on the pavement, whether it is safe for them to cross in terms of the oncoming traffic and to assess what's happening behind as to whether they are likely to, to be the source of an injury by someone going in the back. Now, the DVSA pretty much has been told the same thing with the examiners, which you can read in the dispatch that was released by the DVSA in, in a minute. Um, you might have to have a pen and paper in a second. I might be able to get that for you. I don't think it's in this, um, in this PowerPoint. I'm just going in to get that for you. Give me one second. There we go, let's try that. Um, so the situation is that the, um, the Mark Wynn has released uh, through the DVSA exactly what the DVSA have been told to consider for driving faults, um, uh, ser serious and dangerous faults. And in the dispatch, which I'm just trying to open up, because it closed on me. Here we go. Um, dispatch. Uh, dispatch.blog.gov.uk is if you go into that and you'll pick up the dispatch, the recent dispatch that came out, which I think came out about two or three days ago, um, and it actually is changes to the highway code, how they affect driving tests. And what Mark Wynn has put in there on behalf, and he's one of the chief examiners for the um, for the driving test for the for the DVSA. Um, it is um, on a driving or riding test, failure to give way to someone who is clearly waiting to cross the road, but is standing safely on the pavement would normally be assessed as a driving or riding fault. This is because the candidate would be deviating from the defined outcome. It's clear though, that our examiners will need to consider all factors, including the presence of following traffic, the speed on the approach, the visibility and actions of the person waiting to cross, and whether it was clear the person intended to cross. So it's not cast in stone that because someone's standing there, that standing on the pavement this is, that you've got to stop come what may. You don't have to, if there's a safety aspect there, that an, that an accident could ensue if you don't move out of the way. So must give way to pedestrians is a different situation. You must give way, mandatory, if they are on the road, okay? So pedestrian crossings, the rules have always been, you must give way to people on the crossing, okay? Um, but it is, you should give way if they're standing on the pavement, okay? So the um, situation with, um, now, uh, just give me a minute, the people are asking for this blog. The blog is dispatch.blog.gov.uk. Howard, I've just put it in the chat. It's yeah, well, chat box, okay, do that, yeah. Pick it up from the chat box. Thomas put it in. If you go into the chat box, you can copy it down, okay? So we've got must give way to pedestrians on zebra crossings and pedestrians and cyclists on parallel crossings. One of the pre-questions I got is, could I please explain what a parallel crossing is? It is an elongated zebra crossing with the same black and white stripes, but on one side of it is an area of very thick pedestrian markings, which is the, the, the boundary of which cyclists can ride across the crossing at the same time. 
So effectively, it's a situation where um, a cyclist is able to go across a zebra crossing at the same time as pedestrians, but it's segregated to its own space. And that will join up with a cycle lane on a pavement on the other side, or permission to use the pavement as a cycle lane on the other side. So that's what a, a, a parallel crossing is. They are reasonably new. There aren't many around. I've seen a few, there aren't many around. Um, Carlos, the link is in the chat box. Go down to the bottom of the chat box, uh, or at the top, wherever the chat box is on your, and you'll see it in the chat box. Okay, um, so the uh, situation with, with the parallel crossings, it's an elongated, you will know it when you see it, it's an elongated zebra crossing and still controlled by the Belisha beacons. It's not controlled with lights, it's Belisha beacons, the, the flashing um, amber beacons on the black and white poles, okay? Uh, horse riders should give way to pedestrians waiting to cross a zebra crossing if they're on the major road uh, and to pedestrians and cyclists waiting to cross a parallel crossing. So horses, they're higher down, they're further down the hierarchy, therefore they're giving way to pedestrians in this instance. Cyclists also need to give way to pedestrians on shared use cycle tracks and horse riders on bridleways. So again, the hierarchy is that um, uh, it's, it's expanded onto off-road areas as well. So cycle tracks can be classed as part of a highway, to be honest, so that is why it's included in the highway code. Uh, only pedestrians may use the pavement. Pedestrians include wheelchair and mobility scooter users, as I said earlier. So bear in mind that um, you know, it's not just pedestrians, people on legs, it is people that could be in the wheelchairs as well. Uh, yes, Martin, it's like a toucan crossing, but it is an elongated zebra crossing is effectively what it is. Okay, all right. Um, right, those who want this link, it is in the chat box. You have to find the chat box on your screen. I, I can't keep repeating it because I don't have time to do so. It is in the chat box. It is there, okay? Right, if you can move on to the next slide, please, Tom. Right, so... Um, Rules uh, for drivers and motorcyclists is the hierarchy three. Uh, you mustn't cut across cyclists, horse riders or horse-drawn vehicles going out when you are turning into or out of a junction or changing direction or lane, just as you would not turn across a path of another motor vehicle. We didn't anyway. Why the hell do they have to reiterate that? We didn't do that anyway. So that's caused confusion because people now think this is new. It isn't new, it's nothing new. It's exactly what we did before. So um, this applies whether you're using a cycle lane, cycle track, or riding ahead on the road, and you should give way to them. We had to anyway, it's no different. So don't worry too much about that part of it. Now, it, we do have to be careful a bit more now. There is a bit more situation um, where we've got to be a little more disciplined in the gaps we have between cyclists. That is what comes on here. Where we used to try and cut across a cyclist um, they may have put their brakes on. We now have to ensure that if we cross the path of a cyclist going straight ahead, that like a vehicle, we do not make them use the 5S rule. The stop, slow down, swerve, shake their fist or swear at you. OK, if you're going to make them do any of those five S's, you've done it wrong. And that's what the examiner is going to see. And that's what they're going to look for. That's not in the blog that Mark was put out, but basically that's what he's alluding to. If you're going to make them stop, slow down, swerve, shake their fist or swear at you, then you've got the judgment wrong. And we've got to train the judgment to the students to make sure that they can cross in a safe gap. OK, um, so you should stop and wait in a, for a safe gap in, follow, in the flow of cyclists necessary. This includes when cyclists are approaching, passing or moving vehicles, um, that they are um, moving past or waiting alongside stationary or move, slow moving traffic, traveling round a roundabout. We're going to talk about roundabouts in a minute, okay? So I know there's a lot of questions and a lot of worry about roundabouts. I will cover roundabouts in just a minute. Um, what I want to do now is just have a look at the questions if I can. Um, guide dogs, let's go back to guide dogs because we've, we're talking about pedestrians and, and on the side of the road. Guide dogs are trained not to cross when traffic is there. They're trained to look for gaps in traffic and then guide the person across the road. If you've got traffic around you and you are coming into a junction um, and the other vehicles haven't stopped, the vehicles in front of you and they haven't stopped, continue. It's best not to give way to them 
unless they are in the road. If the dog has decided there's a safe gap, you're looking at the dog's hierarchy guiding the blind person. So if the dog is in the road, the dog is the person you've got to give way to who is guiding the blind person. That's what you've got to consider, okay? Um, uh, we've got a few more questions on here. What have we got here? Do we have to give way on the approach to a T-junction and the approach to a roundabout if pedestrians waiting to cross? I'll talk about roundabouts in a minute. We've already mentioned about junctions, it includes T-junctions, but we're talking about people who are in, in the minor road. We're not talking about people once you've come out of the minor road into the major road who are crossing. That is not the mouth of a junction. However, we still have to make an informed choice as to whether it's safe to let them cross if they're in the road. Well, I mean, if they're in the road, they've got to let them go. But if on the pavement waiting to cross, then uh, we've got to make an informed choice as to whether it's safe to do that as well, or whether we're going to get traffic bearing down from our right or the people from behind that are likely to shunt you. That's what we've got to watch for. Okay. Um, do you advocate the horn in use of such circumstances um, in the system of car control? Uh, this would be a bold move on a driving test. If you've got a situation where um, you think the horn is necessary, I would always say that the horn should be used to warn people that you are there, of course, but always raise a hand as a gesture of, I didn't mean it as a rebuke. Now that's what motorcyclists, motorcyclists are normally taught to do, is that if they have to use their horn, it's a short beep on horn and a raised hand to say, thank you mate, I just want to make you know I'm here. If you do it that way, it's not so bad. But if you're going to use the horn come what may, um, it can be taken as a rebuke or get out of my way and be a bit bullshy. And, and that would certainly, our test, be marked against you. So I'd say, Richard, that if you're using horns, they've got to be used, if you use them on the move, uh, they've got to be used very carefully. Um, the only time they can be used when you're stationary is if you feel another moving object is going to hit you. Uh, that's just to add that to you as well. Um, let's go on then. If we can move on, please, Tom, to the next slide. And this is other change in the highway code. There's uh, two, four, six, seven of them. Six, seven other changes in the highway code. And they are pretty much straightforward, to be honest. I'm just going to find them. Here we go. Changes that last one I like. Here we go. Right, so, um, on the hierarchy of your roads we've spoken about, we're talking about pedestrians crossing the road, people crossing the road, okay? So, when people are crossing waiting to cross at a junction, other traffic should give way. We use that word should again, not must, okay? If they're in the road, you must. If, they're, if they are um, trying to cross, they're waiting to cross, and they look like they've got the intention to cross, you should give way. But as I've mentioned from Mark Wynne's blog, the examiners would say that they are looking for the action of other road users and what danger you're placing yourself, your vehicle into if you did actually stop at what could be the wrong time, okay? So um, if they start to cross in traffic, then they've got to be allowed to continue. You've got to give them, the, the traffic's got to give way to them. Um, people driving, riding motorcycle or cycling must give way to people on a zebra crossing and people walking or cycling on a parallel crossing. So that's, that's the rules we've got with the pedestrians crossing at junctions. It includes whether you're turning left into a T-junction or right into a T-junction, whether you're turning left approaching the end of the minor road where the giveaway lines are, turning left or right. So if you've got someone, you're approaching the major road and you haven't left the minor road yet and you're coming up to the giveaway lines, you're also going to have to give way to pedestrians when you are trying to exit. So that means speed on approach has to be brought down you're going to bring your speed down according to how well you can see at the end of the junction. And obviously, if you're turning left into a junction and it's rather closed, you're going to have to get your students looking into the junction and you're going to have to tell them you know, your approach speed has got to be suitable for what's going on around you. But also, how well can you see into the junction? You need to get your speed down in case you've got to turn. We cannot rely on this thing of the pedestrians crossing at a place where they can be seen. This is what we've got to be careful of. We can't rely on that onus of a pedestrian doing that. So we, we, looking at the hierarchy, they are higher up the hierarchy than we are as a driver, so we have to give way where, we, where necessary. 
Um, if we talk about the situation of walking, cycling and riding in shared spaces, this is mainly our off-road situations and cycle lanes. So um, the guidance on that, the guidance on that um, is uh, there's new guidance in the code about routes and spaces which are shared uh, by people walking, cycling and riding horses. Normally you get a blue sign on a post if it's a bridleway or a cycleway um, saying it as a sharing situation. Um, I know we're talking about um, really talking about being on the road here, but we also have to, you might get the question from the student, what about bridleways? What about um, uh, cycle lanes? This hierarchy uh, is literally extending onto off-road sections as well, where it's made up tarmac or, or a recognized, um, a recognized uh, causeway that is used for the transport of cyclists, horse riders and pedestrians. That's pretty much part of a highway and therefore these rules exist anywhere where there is reasonable access to the public and pedestrians, horse riders, cyclists are members of the public. So it's actually in the Highways Act, it is enforceable in those areas. So in shared spaces on the, on the road, um, people are asked not to overtake horses on the left hand side. This is quite important that cyclists, especially in cars, if horses are waiting to turn right anywhere, um, you're pretty much being asked to hold back and not pass them on the left. Um, so that's that's one thing that is rather new um, to us to, to, to consider. When um, we also have a change in positioning in the road when people are cycling, cyclists are now encouraged and have been encouraged for some time to cycle in what's known as the dominant position. Motorcyclists will understand that, that expression straight away. A dominant position is pretty much where the, um, the cyclist will be riding in a position that a vehicle would normally take on roads where they're reasonably able to keep up with flow of traffic. And I mean reasonably able. You're not gonna get a cyclist fit enough to cycle at a sort of 40 miles an hour in a 40. Uh, you, but they might be able to do 23 or 24 in a 30. And therefore they've got to be given the space to be able to do that. So we now have to treat them as a motorized vehicle in an overtaking situation. They should move over to the left when the road, uh, it, when it's such that the traffic is building up behind them and it's safe for them to be over to the left where the road is not unkempt and there aren't obstructions that can cause them danger. And that's the situation of them moving over. Um, it's not a situation where the cyclists now are in the road. It's now the highway code is being changed to a road sharing manual instead of a book of blame. Yes, they've got the hierarchy, but what they're saying, like the H1 is a statement. People should start to consider each other. So it is helping to make the highway code a statement of road sharing rather than a book of blame. Okay. So overtaking when driving or cycling is um, a situation where the clearances have got to be greater now. Uh, it's one and a half meters minimum. Um, so it's, 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 it's the width of the vehicle, if over width and a half of the vehicle, if over 30 miles an hour, if the road width allows it. So we've, if, if the road width doesn't allow that, we got to do the same sort of thing as we did with meeting an adequate clearance where we ideally want to have a door's width, more than a door's width, to clear a space on both sides of the road if it's quite a narrow road. So if anyone opens a door, we can clear it. If we haven't got that, we compensate for the lack of space by reducing the speed. So we do the same with the horse riders. If we haven't got that clearance, then, we have, and, and then we've got to go past a lot slower or hold back. It's as simple as that. It's as, very simple, okay? Um, the thing with cycling at junctions, there are these two stage junctions that are about now, which are light controlled for bikes. The, the lights are at the face height, shoulder height of cyclists. There are lots of them around London and probably in the, in the big conurbaceous cities as well, Sheffield, Manchester, Birmingham. They're probably there, Liverpool, probably, probably in those places as well. I haven't been there to see them, but they are in London. And these are designed to allow when the drivers, the road traffic has a red light, 
it allows the more vulnerable to move forward to another area to help them with an advanced turn. Uh, it's totally legal. It does look like that the cyclists are crossing the big red light, but lower down, they have been given a green light with a picture of a cycle on it, which allows them to go beyond. It's like a bit like a, an arrow in a certain direction with a red light and a, and a lane going a different direction. It's very similar to that, as far as we're concerned. The cyclists are allowed to move forward to go to the direction they intend to move on to, and are then given a further light to be able to move on um, to wherever direction they're going. So there are two stage junctions, but there are different, there are now small uh, pedestrian height traffic lights for bikes that we have to be aware of. So we need to educate the students, our, our candidates, that they exist. And that is why cyclists may be changing their behavior. And it looks like they're breaking the law, but they're not. They are actually guided to move forward. Um, advanced cycle lanes have got a bit more clarity as well now. So advanced, cycle, advanced cycle markings at junctions where we've got the two stop lines. Um, it's always been that uh, the motorized vehicles should stop at the first line and the second area for the bikes. It's now that if the cyclists that are alongside vehicles trying to move forward when there is a when there isn't an advanced cycle um, stopping area, the cyclists must be given priority to move ahead of the vehicle at the front of the queue. That is also something that is in the highway code, and we must be aware of that. That is uh, that is now a, law, a, a rule that has to be observed that cyclists must have priority to move off first. Okay. Now this information I'm giving you is um, is on gov.uk, and if you Google in the eight changes to the highway code, um, this will come up is where I'm referring to, and you'll see all this information in there, okay? Um, cyclists, horse riders, horse-drawn vehicles at roundabouts. Let's get the roundabouts out of the way. Roundabouts, if you look on a DL25 form, where does the examiner mark roundabouts? He marks them as junctions. And the reason he marks them as junctions, in the government's um, manual for road construction, roundabouts are classed as junctions so all of the um, legislation and all of the standards of road maintenance building etc for roundabouts comes under the junctions section the dvsa have clarified three times now um, to the industry that they are junctions and therefore the rules in the highway code for junctions t junctions apply to roundabouts uh, exits of roundabouts and when you enter a roundabout um, now, we again, we go back to what Mark Wynne has said in the changes to the Highway Code in the enforcing of good behaviour, that we have to consider when we do this, we should do this if they're on the side of the road. If the pedestrians are in the road, we must stop. Now, let's just segregate roundabouts, where you go off a roundabout and there are um, controlled and uncontrolled crossings. So we've got we've got the um, light controlled junctions, sorry, light controlled crossings, and the zebra and parallel crossings. They are a area where there are rules and regulations that we must abide to anyway. What we're referring to here is when there is no crossing that is controlled or uncontrolled, and the situation where someone waits to cross the road, so they're, they're, they're chance their arm uh, are getting are getting through the cross the traffic. Again, it's a situation where you now have to, you should give way to them. In other words, you ought to give way to them, but you can only do that if it's safe to do so. Um, so it's a situation where you'd have to check what's coming off the round right behind you. And God forbid you've got another lane next door to you and there's a dual carriageway. You cannot control what the person's gonna do in lane two. You cannot control that. So if you're not careful, it could be a situation that if you do the wrong action, especially if you wave anybody into the road, and I'll talk about that in a minute, you wave anybody in the road across the road, you can wave them into danger. You are actually aiding and abetting any accident that takes place. So the highway code now specifically says, and it has said about flashing of headlights anyway, flashing of headlights are only to convey that you are there. Has anybody seen you? They have never been written down as a giveaway symbol. So you mustn't 
do it as a priority symbol to give priority to other than flashing lights at them. That is not allowed anymore. And also waving and just gesturing people into the road is no longer allowed either because of the situation. It could put the person in the higher area of the hierarchy into danger. You're encouraging them to go into danger. And this is why we say you should give way and you must give way. You don't give way if it's going to be dangerous for someone's going to slam you in the back or where you are if for you to stop and let them cross. It's likely that they are going to cross into danger into an area you can't control. So you've got to make an informed decision. You've got to train your students now for this judgment, this better judgment that they really need to have in roundabout situations. It's very important that we get that across. Where there are controlled or uncontrolled crossings, we use the normal rules, rules and regulations of whether we stop, whether we should stop, whether we must stop. But when it comes to the situations where there are no crossings, we've got a bit of a problem. Now, the situation we've got as well, uh, questions we've had prior to this um, webinar, is about refugees in the middle of a major road uh, or uh, a high street, whatever. That is classed as a curb. And therefore, if someone is standing in the center of the road, it is classed them being on the edge of the pavement. It's your informed choice as to whether you let them cross the road or not. Zebra crossings that have an island in the middle are classed as two crossings. OK, so if they are at the middle, they you, you are duty bound at a zebra crossing or a parallel crossing to stop and let them cross. Those were the rules anyway before. So uh, you you need to you to embark on that. But where there are refuge points in the middle of a road, it is your discretion whether you let them cross. It's classed as a pavement, but it's, it's not a pavement. So the highway code says that uh, where there is a refuge uh, is, is regarded as a safer area for someone to cross. It doesn't actually stipulate that you've got to stop for them. So really and truly, um, although it is classed as a pavement, it is your choice as to whether you stop for them or not. And the examiner should not be penalising you for not stopping for somebody who's at a refuge in the middle, a normal pedestrian refuge. I'm not talking about where it's at a crossing, uh, controlled or uncontrolled. If it's just a refuge, um, you make a decision as to whether you allow them to cross or not. If there's every intention they're going to cross and it looks like they're going to step in the road, then yeah, you're going to have to take some evasive action. Of course you will. But once they're in the road, you have got to ensure that um, that, that is adhered to. Um, what have we got here? Parking, charging and leaving vehicles. Um, there are new laws coming into parking, which uh, looks like are going to come in in March. It looks like it's March the 25th. Uh, that was released this morning. And I'm just trying to find the information about this for you. Just give me one second, please. I'm on the wrong one. So I'm on the wrong screen. Right, here you go. Um, so looking at... Um, Parking, charging and leaving vehicles. Um, when leaving vehicles, there's something called the Dutch reach and that is where your the driver, their left hand, sorry, the right hand, the hand closest to the door should go on to the uh, handle of the door and the left hand should go to the clasp, the opening mechanism of the door. So that way, if you have got your right hand on the handle grip, the door handle grip, which you normally grab to shut the door with, then the, wind, the door cannot blow it in the wind. And it gives you more, more impetus to be able to swing your body around through your hips to look over your shoulder and look wider than where the blind spot mirror is on your car, if you've got one, to be able to see what is approaching from the side to make sure the door doesn't hit somebody in the higher area of hierarchy, i.e. the cyclists, the moped riders, the um, the, the pedestrians. Um, so it's, uh, it includes when not just the driver getting out, but the pedestrian getting out as well, that uh, they don't hit people on the pavement. So it's a situation where we have to make sure um, is a, uh, a, a a culture we now build into the controls lesson, especially of we, we should do a, a how they get. I mean, it's silly, but we should be teaching them how to get into a car properly, how to get out of it properly. And that's the one thing that must now be included in the controls lesson. And whenever they get out of the vehicle at the end of a lesson, or whenever you get to change over, right, what's the procedure for opening this door properly? And what's this is in the highway code now, what is that procedure? And we really have to reiterate it. 
uh, parking the vehicle. We are not allowed, as, as from the 25th of March, we will not allow you to park on the pavement. Um, this hasn't been clarified by the government yet, but it looks like it will be. Um, it looks like by all the intentions of where it is in the legislative um, canal at the moment, it looks like it will go through. And it looks like from the 25th of March that parking on the pavement with two wheels on the pavement will be a £70 fine and can put points on the licence as well. Um, so that's, we'll have to watch that space as to whether it actually comes in. So we'll make sure that we are aware of that when we hear more about it. We are also um, hearing noises now. Any parking of a vehicle against the flow of traffic, no matter what the speed limit is, day or night, leaving the vehicle unattended will shortly be illegal. If you're unloading the vehicle, that's not a, that's okay. That's not a problem. If you're there with the engine running momentarily and you're dropping somebody off, isn't a problem. But if you are parking, unless you are a large lorry unloading and there's a loading bay on the wrong side of the road and you're allowed to load in it, that's okay. But generally parking on the road facing the wrong way, and it's all to do with the fact that there's no reflectors on the front of vehicles, that there's been too many situations, especially at night, where vehicles have had head-on smashes and they've hit obstructions where they're, they're not classed as properly lit. Now, I know reflectors don't light, but they do reflect. Uh, and this is part of it. The regulations for night time, for skips and everything else being lit at night, have also been strengthened too. Um, and that's the uh, situation from, um, I, I, they have mentioned it in Highway Code now, but it's going to be made stronger and strengthened from the 25th of March about parking on the wrong side of the road, except for a one-way street. That's the only exception you've got, or for loading and unloading uh, in a situation where you are a commercial vehicle and the loading bay is on that side of the road for you to be able to unload on that side of the road. That really is the, uh, the situation. So um, we still need to teach the learners to stop on the other side of the road to do reversing because that is for one-way streets and to be able to pull off because you've got to remember that some of these learners when they pass their tests will work for companies that will be um, a situation of, of doing deliveries or driving for business where they may have to do that. Um, it's pretty much the same um, somebody saying, well, hang on, the examiners aren't testing uh, some of the reversing manoeuvres, so why are we training them? Well, you've got to train them because the situation is that if an examiner goes on the test route and the road is closed by an incident and the police say, I'm sorry, you're not going this way, you're going to have to go another way, and or the student has to turn the vehicle around, the examiner's not going to change seats and turn the vehicle around and then carry on because the student hasn't been taught that manoeuvre. If the student can't do that manoeuvre, and it's in the parameters of the start and end of the test, the student will be tested on that manoeuvre. Whether that is a, a, a discipline on the test or not, the examiner has to test the student to be competent and confident at being able to control and manoeuvre the vehicle in any situation on any road. And therefore all manoeuvres, including the reverse round the corner to the right, should be taught. So this is the same situation. You're still going to teach the pull up on the right hand side of the road and reverse backwards into uh, and, then, and then move off again. You're still going to teach that because some of the students, it'll only be a minority, but some of the students may have to do that sometime in their working life. So everybody has to be taught it. It might seem to some instructors me saying that, well, that means I can get more faults on my tip report. Hard luck. Sorry to say that and be brash about it. Hard luck. Deal with it. We are supposed to be professional. We must teach professionally. Simple as that. And that's all I'm going to say about it. Can you move on, please, Tom? Okay, parallel crossings. Here's the low down the parallel crossings. Um, right. It enables cyclists to cross a road safely with the same level of priority as a zebra crossing. Okay. So this is the situation. Um, I, I can't produce a picture for this. There is one, but I couldn't transpose it from where I got it from because it's a copyright picture. But uh, I, I believe in the new highway code, uh, there isn't a print version of the highway code at the moment, but there is a gov.uk update version, which can be downloaded by um, Googling new highway code 2022. It still has a 2021 cover on it. Don't be confused by the one that's got the circular 
um, items, that's the cover for the current Northern Ireland Highway Code. But there is a new highway code that is available to you, which has got all of the, I think it's 251, whatever it is, rules in it. It actually um, is updated online with all the hierarchy stuff and everything else, all the amendments are in it with diagrams, but it's not printable at the moment until April. Uh, they're waiting to make sure that all the anomalies are ironed out before they print it. Now, what the, what the government are wishing to do is they're wishing to tap in more to the media that the youngsters are akin to, which is apps. So there is or will be, I'm not sure if it's out at the moment, but there will be a highway code app. And what's going to happen is the printed version of the highway code will disappear. Uh, it's a bit of a shame to us because it's a good learning tool, but it means that we'll have to be able to use the app to use as a learning tool in the vehicle. Um, the app is easier to update. It costs a lot less, it can be done quicker, and it can keep us all up to speed a lot quicker than waiting for printed, um, printed application. Mariana, thank you. It says it's already available. Thank you, Mariana. I, I wasn't aware if it was. I looked last week and it was put up on, on, the, I, on the app store uh, on Friday last week and 20 minutes wanting to go back to buy it, it had been, it had been taken down again, but it looks like it's been put back up, so there must be something wrong with it. But it is available, you can get it. I think it costs £3.49, I think it is, but it is available um, and it is all updated and it will be continually updated and it can update quicker than they can with the printed versions. There is going to be a printed version of the Highway Code and it said it will be out in the spring, which is April, May time, and there's going to be an updated version of the driving essential skills, which will reflect these hierarchies and everything else as well. Um, and the Highway Code app is a great innovation. Well done, Anthony, thank you for that backup. That's going to tell everybody. Um, so it's very good. Uh, so we might have to, those who don't, don't really uh, subscribe to the online environment, I think you're going to have to very soon because that's the way it's all moving. Uh, the students, it, it, their preferred learning method is visual. Uh, that means they can read things online, but they can also watch films online. And the go-to thing for them, the go-to device is their mobile phone or a tablet. So I think with, with the ADIs are gonna have to embrace this pretty soon, if they're not already. Okay, um, have we got another slide, Tom? I'm not sure we have. There's the uh, link for, um, all the information for the eight changes is that link there. Uh, I think Tom's put that in the chat box as well already. So uh, you can obtain that. Um, what I'm gonna do now is go through some of the questions we've got in the q and I'm wary we've only got 10 minutes to go and I'm sorry, I've, I've got a hard stop at 12 o'clock. I have an appointment to phone somebody at the DVSA. I have got to do that uh, because I'm involved with other issues like the, D, like the B plus C and I've got things I've got to do. So I'm afraid I have to stop at 12. So, um, no, then, I've done that one already. Let's have a look. Cycle path separated from the carriage where it crosses the mouth of the minor road. There are giveaway markings on the cycle path. Presumably cyclists should still give way to vehicles. Yes, the cyclists, wherever there are giveaway lines, let's just clarify what a giveaway means. Giveaway means priority to the major highway. Uh, sorry, right. Priority to the major highway ahead to allow traffic to continue unhindered by you. This is why a giveaway line, you don't have to stop if it's safe not to do so. So you can continue, providing you made all the proper observations, you're doing the correct speed, you've got the correct position, and you are not gonna make anybody else stop, slow down, swerve, shake their fist, or swear. It's only a white stop line where you've got to stop, the wheels have got to be stopped turning and the vehicle must be under control. Doesn't mean to say necessarily the parking brake needs to be applied. Of course, if it's an enforced stop where you're gonna be there for some time, the parking brake should be applied. You shouldn't be holding the vehicle on a clutch and ideally in an automatic vehicle, just be wary how long you hold the vehicle in drive on a brake, on the foot brake, because you're doing incredible damage to your torque converter, which on the average automatic gearbox costs three and a half grand to replace. So get your students to use neutral more. 
That way they don't go through reversing lights. So don't they can put it in park when they stop for a long time unless you can leave the vehicle unattended or you're gonna stop up, turn the engine off and chat. You should be getting them to use neutral a bit more and go back to drive. That way they don't go through the reversing lights in front and go behind. Um, but the give way, you can continue across the giveaway line if it is safe to do so. So the gut is over people on the bikes, on the pavements, if they've got a little mini giveaway line there, they should be giving way to people across the other side of the giveaway line because that is the priority carriageway. That is the priority highway. Okay, so that answers your question there, whoever that was, who was that? Elaine, okay, um, let's have a look. If a pedestrian is at a small island, sorry, I've just lost that name. So if pedestrians at small island crossing in the middle of a major road, should we let them cross if our action doesn't affect following traffic? Yes, you can. No reason why you can't. Okay. Uh, and if it's not clear where the pedestrian wants to go, say we're driving on the major road and want to turn into a minor road. Okay. The pedestrian is standing on the pavement right at the apex of a bend. And we don't know if they want to cross the major road and wouldn't stop it. Or if they want to cross the major road, should stop. Right. If this is what you're looking at here, yes, you've seen the pedestrian. The next priority you've got to consider is your action. Is it safe to stop to let them cross? Is it safer for you to continue? Now, as I've gone back to Mark Wynn, the DVSA senior examiner, I think he's a chief examiner, certainly for motorbikes, I'm not sure if he's for cars, but he is the guy who's written the blog which has told all the industry exactly what the DVSA's thoughts are on this. We are in a situation where we have to consider other road users and the DVSA are doing that on the test. So you've got to consider if it's safe option for you to stop to let them cross. If they are in the road, you must stop for them. Now, unfortunately, other people might not. I'm urging all ADIs now to have forward and rear view cameras in their car because we can get a, a, a blame culture thing going on here coming up very soon where we used to have the people jam their brakes on in front of us uh, we could get the situation where people are going to hit us from behind now if someone hits you from behind yes it's their fault but it still bloody hurts so the situation we've got here is we really need to know what is going on behind for evidence if you have to go to court to say the reason I stopped was because so and so was in the road and I'm duty bound to do it and someone slams in the back of you, it might get termed uh, something in your favour and you might be able to get more of the payback from the third party instead of losing some of the uninsured losses which you might otherwise lose. I strongly advise that you invest in forward and reverse camera, uh, forward and uh, rear facing cameras in your vehicles now. Okay, um, where am I? I'm just trying to look up now. So what we've got, we've already done that already. We've covered that already somewhere. Um, can't see that. Okay, uh, are you suggesting on approach to a roundabout, we would need to give way to pedestrians stood at the side of the road before making a final approach and at what distance back? Um, really, I, I can't answer that, Anthony, to be honest because it's going to depend on the roundabout layout, how open the junction is, how well you can see it, the flow of the traffic on the roundabout, the speed it's going. If you're in a continual flow of traffic and someone's waiting on the side and it's uncontrolled, it's, there's no crossing there at all for them to cross at, they are just trying to edge their bets to get across the road. Um, you've got to make sure, you know, I, I would continue with the flow of traffic, especially if it's dual carriageway. Um, you know, you've got two lanes there, more than one lane there. Uh, I would be very, very careful indeed um, but the situation is that um, if you're the if it's very quiet and you're the only the first of a, of, of a queue or say there's nobody else around you, no one behind you, no one can possibly fall in the back of you, and everyone can see what your intentions are, then perhaps you should stop. But again, it's the onus of should stop, not must stop. So again, it's an informed choice of the danger you would be in if you stopped to allow that person to cross the road. We've got to risk assess a lot more than we did. We've got to think a bit more outside the box. We've got too many ADIs, and I'm not being disrespectful to anybody here. We have too many ADIs in our industry who are looking at text, looking at it black and white, and trying to do it to the printed word. The ADI, the, the, the highway code 
is a little bit more subjective than that. And it is, that's why they use the word should. Yeah, you ought to stop, but there'll be circumstances where you can't. You've got to start reading between the lines because the police will, if they have to come to an incident, they won't say, they won't go poking your chest with their forefinger and say, you didn't stop because I woke, I said you should do. They'll say, right, what's the reason why you didn't then? Build me the picture of what happened here. And they'll be subjective with it. Yeah, okay, Mike, I can see where you're coming from now. That's what it'll be. So it's not a situation. We've got to know what should means. Should means you ought to, but there'll be circumstances where you can't. And that's what it's got to be. We are urging as NASP to put this to the DVSA and say, if you can use the same terminology to the examiners and say, well, when you assess, that's what you've got to think. The candidate should stop or to stop. Can they stop? If they think along that hierarchy and then assess what the candidate does, then that really, if we're both all the, the training side and the assessing side, the DVSA will be on the same page because you guys are not able at the moment to go in the back of a car and a company. So we're in a situation here where um, you're not going to see the aspects and the, uh, and the context of how the examiners are actually uh, marking. You're not going to see the road layout. All you're going to see is a, a report form with a, a mark on it saying that there's a driving fault for this and you're not there to see the context of how it happened. You're relying on a relatively inexperienced driver telling you what happened unless you can hear the debrief. So it's a situation that we really, um, really need to be thinking of the highway code a little bit more subjectively and thinking that should means ought to. You ought to do it. It's not, you've got to stop. You ought to stop, only if you can. And that's what I urge you to think of. Um, should you consider using the slowing alarm signal? Yes, Handy, if it is necessary, if it is appropriate, providing some poor old motorcyclist is not gonna get garroted, okay? So you've gotta make sure it's appropriate, necessary, and timed, okay? Uh, Ian, shouldn't the clutch, shouldn't the Dutch, hang on. Shouldn't the Dutch be driver and um, you might be right, uh, Ian. You might be right. It's making sure that the body can twist round when you open the door. The body can twist round to be able to see quite clearly what's happening along the side of the car in perhaps an area that the mirrors can't look into behind the vehicle and wider than what the blind spot will see. So it's a position where you've got to be able to grab the door so it can't blow in the wind, but make sure that um, you can see behind to ensure that the door is able to open into clear space. That's what we're doing, okay? How far across the road do pedestrians need to be before you move on? Is it the same as a zebra crossing where they need to be completely off the road? We're being too prescriptive here. Um, the situation is here that you are allowing them to cross if they're going to cross and then wait in the middle of the road for the traffic on the other side to stop, then perhaps it might be wise for you to stay where you are. So if they've got to walk back onto the pavement again where you've come from in order for your own safety, someone starts beeping them, they've got an escape route to run away to. Probably better you wait until they, they're at least on the other side of the road. But um, I wouldn't be too prescriptive with that. On pedestrian crossings, yes, and the zebra crossings, they've got to be on, the, on either the refuge in the middle or they've got to be on the other side of the road if no central refuge exists. That's one thing we have to, uh, to do. Right, I'm, I've got to go. I'm afraid I've got to stop this now. We have got more questions here and I've got to be on the phone in 10 minutes. So I, I've got to stop now. So um, the questions are all recorded here. And I think most of this stuff is actually um, questions of what I've already said and they've come, I've seen them later after I've actually spoken about it where people have typed the questions before I've brought the topic. Some of these questions are 11.25 and I'm, I'm talking about junctions, pedestrians, which I spoke about afterwards. So I'm afraid I'm going to have to stop this here now. Um, uh, any major questions, that, major things that haven't been mentioned in this webinar, if you would like to put that in email to support at driving.org, that comes through to the ADI help desk and I will answer those or either me or Karen will answer those. Um, that's the support email for the ADI training side of things. If you have any queries about membership payments, uh, not getting your goods, then go to membership at driving.org. If you want anything to talk about courses, what they involve, training at driving.org. 
And if you wish to go for anything else, like you'd like to get involved with the tax service, the recovery service, etc., that's help at driving.org. But the questions to me, please, can you um, can you please get hold of me and Karen through support at driving.org? Okay, uh, I've got to leave it there. I'm sorry, I, I can't go any longer. But thank you all for attending. We've had uh, a lot of you here today. I know there's people on Facebook that are listening as well. So um, if we find we're getting an awful lot of questions here, perhaps we'll hold another uh, webinar on the questions that we haven't been able to answer. And we'll do that as soon as we can. Okay, I'm going to say goodbye to everybody. Uh, thank you for your help, Tom. And um, we'll, we'll see you all again soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.